Hey everybody, it's Steven from Asian Boss, and I have a random question for you. How much do you love magic? I absolutely love magic and always admired world-class magicians for the joy and sense of wonder that they bring to the world. Because if there's one thing that can bring us all together as a people in these divided times, maybe it's this simple childlike joy. Shin Lim is the two-time winner of America's Got Talent and is widely considered to be one of the greatest card magicians in the world. Shin is currently headlining a residency in Las Vegas with his show Limitless, something that once seemed absolutely impossible to an Asian immigrant kid growing up in the US. So how did he pull it off? Let's find out. Hey Shin. Hey Steven. Wow, you know, it's pretty crazy to be talking to you because we love your work and we've been watching you on, on everywhere really, TV, internet. Uh, thank you, thank you. At this point, is there anybody on the street who doesn't recognize you whenever you go outside? Well, it's usually if I have my glasses on, especially in Vegas, if I have my glasses on and I put my mask on, I could be anybody. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but um, if I have my glasses off and then people would just recognize me. So, right. uh, especially in Vegas, yeah. But if I go to like, um, if I go back home to Boston, nobody recognizes me at all. Even if my glasses off on, no mask, mask. It, like Really? Even, even with your iconic hairstyle? No, no, I think, you know, if people do recognize me, especially like in East Coast, people kind of like are, are to themselves and they don't really like approach me or anything. But here, here in Vegas, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a wild place. Yeah. So everyone just kind of like, oh my God, let me take a selfie. And yeah, it's cool. I'm fine with it. You know, it's, it's yeah. I've kind of gotten used to it. So do you always sort of maintain that hairstyle or? Uh... Oh, no, this is how, it's how I wake up. Uh, this is just, uh, <laughs> this is like, the, I call it like the laziest hairstyle. So I guess for people who don't recognize you, how do you introduce yourself? Do you pretty much say, hey, I'm a magician? Yeah, I, I usually say I'm a close-up magician. So there's many different like categories of magic. Uh, yeah. There's illusions, there's stage magic, there's mentalism, there's hypnotism, there's close-up magic, and then under close-up magic, there's actually like subcategories. There's mm -hmm. card magic coin magic. So I, I always tell people I'm a close-up magician, but more specifically, I do sleight of hand card magic. So um, I, I don't really yeah, say I'm like a, like a magician. I don't really say that off the bat. I think I, I want to like kind of teach people more, a little bit more about like the, the difference and the little nuances in magic that maybe some people might not know. Not many people know, but uh, in my previous life, I was actually a, a, an amateur close-up card magician because oh, really? I, I, I was like super passionate about you know ever since like you know David Blaine when and when like crazy yeah. back in probably like 2001 or something like that I've been sort of practicing constantly but like nowhere near at your level but I, I met it with like that's why how I know about FISM which is like you know for okay. the people who don't know it's like the Olympics right for that's right and, yeah. yeah and you won that in like 2015 or something like that. That is correct. Yeah, in 2015. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's just like, that means you're like literally the best of the best, even among magicians, which, you know, I know how tough that is. For, so. that, for that year, but yeah. Uh, and there's your dog. You, maybe you can yeah, yeah, this, quickly introduce this is yourself. My little, this is my little, uh, one of my, I have two dogs. This is my, my Mamaru is his name. Say hi, Mamaru. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little pom Pomeranian. This, uh, both of them are Pomeranians. Yeah, and I have another one. He's a he's a white white Pomeranian. He's somewhere here. They're, they're both 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 names from an anime. <laughs> nice, nice. Yes. So you're uh, originally from where? So I was uh, I was born in Canada, uh, Vancouver, Canada, and then uh, I only grew up there for like three or four years. And my parents uh, originally are, are from Singapore. They're both Singaporean. We all moved back to, uh, to Singapore. We lived there for like seven or eight years, and then and then my dad got a job in Boston, and then so we moved to moved to Boston, and I kind of grew up there as well. So kind of all over the place, but right, right. Yeah. So when you moved to Boston, was that weird uh, being like an Asian person? Yeah, in a very yeah. white neighborhood. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. How did you know? <laughs> uh, it was, yeah, I, I grew up in Acton, Acton, Massachusetts. It was very many suburban houses. The school was like top 50 in the world, I think. It got like blue ribbon. It's called Acton Boxborough. Mm. It was kind of crazy. It was very overwhelming uh, moving there because we, we spoke English, but even still, like, there's so many like cultural things that 
you don't really know about when you move to a certain uh, when you move to the U.S., especially in high school or, or you know elementary even like uh, just certain things the way you do thing uh, it just it's just different you know and, and when I moved there it was quite a huge shock um, I, I was also homeschooled as well before right. moving to to the U.S. so I never really had like that school environment at all until I moved to the U.S. so it was, it was definitely quite quite a shock yeah as far as your childhood uh do you feel like you had this like natural ability because you know your presentation is amazing and the way you're able to build that that like the theatrics uh you know so would you say that as something that you're like naturally gifted at or something you actively worked on i'm not sure if i was gifted like uh like if it came naturally to me because i so i before i did magic i was actually um, a pianist i i i played piano since i was nine years old or or eight nine or eight uh it, it was in singapore i started in singapore and really early on i was already performing either in recitals or school uh like events uh, or competition i would compete a lot at piano competition and so i did a lot of it and kind of made me like used to this type of performance mm. e competition whether you know whether it be competition or just being able to kind of have this uh energy mm. given to the to the audience and so I, I was very comfortable with that and so when i when i did magic i essentially the the character that i play for magic came from music so it's the same right, right. it's the same type of thing and it never really changed <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. So you don't remember getting nervous uh, in front of a large uh, size of audience? Oh, no, no. I get nervous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially like um, FISM, which is like, the, as you said, the Olympics of magic. That was quite terrifying because it was like, you can imagine the entire audience is all just, not just like amateur magicians. These are professional magicians. And so they all know every single move that you're doing. And so how do you go from, you know, just playing the piano, like from a super early age to even just thinking about becoming a magician? Is that something that you ever thought about, especially as a professional career? Did you, did you know it was possible? Definitely not. No, it, it, it kind of, it was all done uh, through chance, I think, and a little bit of luck. I never planned any of it. I started magic when I was 16. I had already kind of planned my career and, and my future as a concert pianist. I was going to be like, oh, I'm going to perform. I'm going to do this as a job. I only picked up magic because I, <laughs> I thought it would help me get a girlfriend. That's, that's actually why <laughs> I did it. I, I, was, I was like, oh, if I, if I can do these tricks, uh, girls would totally give me their number, but uh, turns out you have to actually talk to them. You can't just show them tricks. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was... <laughs> to be to be fair, there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos where guys do that to a great success. To a great, <laughs> to success. great success, yeah. Not me though. Not in high school. <laughs> um, uh, so, so you've never really touched a deck of cards uh, until the age of sixteen, mm -hmm. or yes, that's that's wow, correct. that's yeah. that's really late. Yeah, yeah. For for magic, it's considered late for for magicians. Yeah, and in terms of like taking it seriously and and, and deciding to do it as a profession, that happened through chance. Um, it, it was in university where I had to kind of make that decision. I was playing piano in university. I, I was a dual major. I I, I majored right, right. in uh, music and I also majored in film as well. I love I love film. I love everything about movies. I, I developed carpal tunnel while I was in university. And to be honest, it was a long time coming. I, I could kind of feel it already happening while I was in uh, high school. Uh, well, when I was my senior year of high school, I could already feel my tendons starting to... Something funny was happening. It wasn't normal. And uh, But then in university, it kind of became even worse. My doctor told me, he, he, he's like, you have to just kind of withdraw for a year and rest yeah. and see how it works, and then you can come back. Uh, but you can't really do two you have to it's too much on your hands because i was i was doing i was doing heavy sleight of hand i was doing cardistry yeah. as well as, and wow. so that 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 can be tough uh on the wrist um and then uh, and i was also doing magic and i was kind of creating some new acts and stuff and so that that takes you kind of have to practice like eight hours a day if you want to really master like a certain yeah. move uh, yeah. it's very yeah. similar to piano to be honest it is very similar to the piano for some reason i knew like that was the moment i had to make a decision I didn't have time to wait, wait a year and then, mm. all right, my wrist is doing better. Let's go back to music. Like it was either, either at this point, I either, I choose my music career or I choose magic. Mm. And so it was almost like a flip of the coin. I was like, okay, I'm just going to do magic. I, just, 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 I, I love both equally, but I'm just going to go for magic and see how this goes. My parents, the, they're 
very realistic. And so mm -hmm. they, they told me like, if you can't like make it on your own by 25, go and, uh, you know, go back to, go back to school, get that piece of paper, you know? And, um, and so I, I, I agreed. I said, okay, if I, if I can't like self-sustain myself by the age of 25, that's it. I'm going to give up on this whole magic thing and go, go back to, uh, trying to be like a, you know, normal, normal, like college degree. I, I only practiced in front of my friends and like my family. And that was really about it. I didn't really like perform. And this is before I dropped out of university. This is like high school and semi-college days i would just yeah i would only perform for like friends i wouldn't make any money i wasn't making any any money at all from from my performances oh really so not even like a like a part-time gig or no uh... no 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 it was only after it was only right after uh after i dropped out of university that that's when i was like okay i should probably start trying to <laughs> make some money so I, I i i did some like birthday parties and when you decided to drop out of university is that something that you put a lot of thoughts into did you talk to your parents about it oh yeah yeah, I, uh, it was such a really tough time in my life. Well, I was depressed for like a year actually during this time. I, because, you know, my, my parents, they're, they're immigrants. They, they, they kind of moved their whole life from Singapore to, to the U.S. And they worked so hard to, mm. to get me there and, and to, to pay for my elementary school, junior high, high school, like, everything and, and and even even college i mean I, I i got a scholarship for for the music school but still it's still even with the scholarship still costs yeah. money like it's yeah. not it's not free you know and they paid for all of that i felt like i had to make it worth it like mm -hmm. i have to i have to be able to to make all all their hard work pay off essentially because if i drop out and then nothing happens i don't get i don't get a uh i can't live or i can't i can't make a career out of this magic thing or or I can't go back to school and get my piece of paper. Like it was, it was all for nothing. And, and for me, that was just, um, the thought of that was really tough on me. Cause I, I, I guess I, I put a lot of pressure on myself sometimes. And so, um, that was just going through my, my mind the whole time, the whole period, it, it was even more for the, more than a year. It took me a while mm -hmm. to be like, okay, I, I think I can, I think I'm actually made the right decision. And then, and that it took, it took a while for that to happen. So. So when, yeah. when you're sort of at that like lowest point, uh, what do you do every day? Because I, I actually know what that feels like. I think a lot of us go through that, that moment when we are depressed. Um, but I guess in my case, you don't really feel like doing anything. Uh, you, you, you become very like lethargic and, and mm -hmm. you, know, you don't see the point. Like what's the point of doing anything? But were you still practicing a ton or, or? I guess I was in my parents' basement for, <laughs> you could say, uh, both figuratively and literally. Um, and I was practicing still, but I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have this like positive energy while I was practicing. Oh, yeah, I got this. Like, I can do this um, type of <laughs> uh, mindset. You know, for me, I was so like, yeah, I just felt like I wasn't doing anything. I felt like I was just kind of staying in my parents' house, living in my parents' house, and just kind of like, what's gonna happen next? I don't really know what's gonna happen in, in the, you know, am I gonna get a gig in the next six months? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's gonna happen. So that was just constantly going through my mind. I had other goals though, cause I knew I, knew I wanted to do FISM. That was mm -hmm. my like be all end all type of thing. I was like, okay, if I, if I win FISM, yeah. then all of this was worth it in, in <laughs> right. for me it was 2012 that was what it was heading towards so that was the first time i competed at FISM. but unfortunately i i actually i actually lost that one i actually quit magic after that because that, that, that at that point i was i was really sad <laughs> I, was, I was like i was like wow okay so all me i dropped out of piano school i i i stayed i live i live with my parents and i i you know i stayed with them for free and i didn't pay them rent or anything that would probably would have been my lowest point well, I think people uh, listening to this, they, they have to appreciate though how ridiculously, insanely hard FISM is. So, like, you know, for example, how many people, ma magicians around the world come together to compete? Because it's, it's, it's a huge event. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's the, the biggest one. So in order to even be there or compete, you have to uh, be represented by your country. So in 2012, I represented Canada. Uh, in 2015, I represented the U.S., so okay yeah, americans i i played for you guys but in, but in 2012 i, I was i, I represented Can, uh, canada and so you have to win the 
the the continent so it's so they call it fism north america but then there's also fism asia there's uh there's fism europe you have to pretty much place in those the the continental version first and then you can move on to the international the big one the the main the main event for the nationals it's it's not in the thousands it's probably like in the hundreds or something like that but yeah but once you get to the the fism international it gets it gets pretty high high up there but but still not 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 like there's not like thirty thousand competitors in the building you know it's it's all it it all gets filtered out so yeah you only really you don't you only really see like the the good ones so you didn't you didn't win at, at, at all no, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't place or anything. No, uh, and so I, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty bummed out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was pretty bummed out. So you came back home, and then you're like, oh, I was like, yeah. I'm done. I, well, I, you know, it's funny. I, <laughs> I don't know why I did this, but I, I wasn't gonna fully quit magic. I was like, okay, I'm gonna try comedy. I was gonna, try, <laughs> I was like, believe it or not, I was, I was like, I was like, I, people don't believe me. I'm like, no, I'm serious. I made a comedy act and I showed it to my parents. It, it didn't work out. <laughs> I showed it my, to my parents and they were like, yeah, no, 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 don't. What are you doing? Is to go back to doing what you're doing. So I was like, okay. I thought it was for nothing, but then there was this one guy uh, and his, uh, his name is uh, uh, Mike Miller and he saw the act at FISM. He's like a agent, manager type of guy. And he was doing this tour in China it was it was in tw- like 28 cities or something like that something crazy i forgot it was so it was so long a two month tour he was like you know what i think i'm going to take a risk on you cuz he he knew i've never performed like legit before <laughs> i I've, I've always done like either competitions or friends or family or unpaid birthday parties like it was just those types of gigs i was doing and he's like i'm just going to bring you along and here's the the crew of of magicians so these guys are like pros <laughs> and so i'm this like 21 year old yeah i'm like this 21 year old kid like coming up like okay let's do let's do this but uh i think that changed everything for me that that tour was what kind of molded me into who i was today and gave me hope as well because it was my first actual paid gig and it it was a lot of money (laughs) it was it was was very a lot of money for for a 21 year old it was a lot of money and i learned so much in those two months by the end of the tour i uh yeah it changed my life forever it really did and then you tried again in 2015. That's right. Uh, and, That's and then you won the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, because of the, the tour in China, um, I, I, I actually got a lot more gigs after that. So there were a lot, a lot more like, festi- uh, like agents and stuff for, from other festivals that, were, that kind of went to these. Like, um, and so they all went to these poly theaters performances where we were at. And they were like, oh, no, no, you're great. We're going to hire you to come to Spain. So I, I went to everywhere around the world. Cause, so I, I went to Italy. I went to Spain. I went to everywhere. I, I, was, I was just traveling. Ever, after 2012, it was, it was kind of being able to perform constantly and rehearse and reset and then rehearse again and then perform again makes you, I guess, more, more mature as a performer. And then um, it, it set me up for 2015. I've actually learned more from losing in 2012 than from winning in 2015, uh, which is the, the most interesting part um, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, because I think this is one thing that people don't appreciate. Yeah, because you hear all the time, oh, you got to fail and fail in order to succeed. But people don't know probably that you went through so you know, much hardship and, and they just see Shin Lim, the, the great Shin Lim on on. America's oh, you want, you want this twice? Da, 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 yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. No, no, no. Of course, it's great to win. Like you know, you you're happy and you get a lot more opportunities after that. But but no, what where I learned the most was yeah in 2012. That was just the that was, that was really a pivotal point in my life. I think it just makes you so much more grateful for uh, everything else that comes after any good opportunity that comes after being at such a down. And when you're more grateful with things, you're able to appreciate it more, see it more, and then kind of extrapolate and learn from it as well. And, and I think that's what happened. I was, I, was, I, was like, I was like, oh, this is an opportunity. Okay, I'm going to try to learn from this. And I think that was what kind of really helped me um, kind of grow a lot, yeah, as a performer. How did your life change exactly after 2015, after you won uh, FISM? 2015, in terms of like um, my career, that was a big one. I think that was the start of like my kind of like the exponential growth of people like kind of noticing me because that was the exact same time I won FISM was the the, the, the same day <laughs> Penn and Teller released that that video, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the performance that I did with yeah. Fool Us. 
and the, I, the performance that yeah and i also <laughs> simultaneously put it on my youtube channel as well yeah, is, yeah it all happened on the same day it was kind of crazy I, I didn't expect it to go viral at all and so i was just like okay i'll just put it out it'll probably get like a thousand views you know, i'll be happy with that I, I just i just want people to appreciate how much synchronicity there is to the music. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was yeah, literally yeah. what I, <laughs> that yeah. was the only thing and, and w even when i was in fullest that was the same thing going through my head I, I was i was like i just hope that they appreciate that i synchronized all the beats perfectly <laughs> and everything was everything was clean and then it went viral and then all the magicians who were at fism was talking about that oh my god this is the, do you see this and they were start sharing mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. so amongst like the magic community it kind of happened overnight everyone was just talking about the act uh mm -hmm. and then they were like yeah this was the act at fism that won and that and so it just built up from there and then of course people outside of magic also started seeing it obviously because mm -hmm. it started going viral uh, on youtube you're an actual real technical magician right whereas Move before monkey, yeah. <laughs> magic was seen to be some sort of like a comedy act or you know people that are not really that technically good but they can you know through sheer presentation things like that but when you come in with your act that even just like wows other professional magicians that's something that hasn't been done before mm. right and then after yeah, you yeah. now everybody like actual professional magicians they all want to come on to to America's Got Talent but you're like the first right. so why did you decide yeah. to go on America's Got Talent after Fulas they, they had contacted me actually AGT they, uh, the AGT like people, their scouters, I guess, they were actually at FISM as well. So they're at oh. FISM 2015, they saw me at FISM. And then of course they saw the Penn and Teller video. So then they contacted me right away. They're like, hey, we, we think you'd be amazing for, for AGT. Why don't you audition? I had always wanted to do AGT. Um, mm -hmm. Ever since I saw Dan Sperry perform on AGT, uh, and Full Howie, I was like, oh, this is a cool show to be a part of. Like, I really want to do it. I think it was 2016 when they they first asked me, and I was like, uh, let's just. I, I I do. I told them I, I do want to do it, but I don't want to do it this year. Uh, let's just wait. Mm -hmm. And so every every year after that, they had they continued to like reminded me that like, hey, you still want to do it. And so I kept saying, oh, one second, one second, let's hold on. <laughs> um, and then in 2018, that's when I decided to compete. Do you actually get to rehearse on the on the stage because it's a massive stage and you know it's very crazy. It's very let me tell you. It's uh, when when it's live, it's very scary. They have all these other acts that are before you and after you that they have to either strike or they have to put on. Just that in itself creates a lot of chaos. Something can happen that's not even under your control, and and then and then all of a sudden you're live. You have to do it properly unless uh you know or else it, or else it just won't look good on tv and so yeah pe people always be like oh like uh, it's not actually live i'm like no 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 <laughs> it's live and and even like the audition and the um the judge cuts yeah those are live too like it's yeah. not like you you mess up and then they're like all right let's let's just do it again i guess like no like they don't have time to redo it they you you, you got your one take that's it like you do it mm -hmm. once and you can't do it again if the judges don't like you that's it. It's pretty. It's pretty. Pretty tough. But at the same time, it's not really because the audience, you know, and the judges, they're the celebrity judges. They're not there to like uh, scrutinize. <laughs> they, they, in, they want yeah. you to succeed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're there for entertainment. They're, they're they're there for the entertainment purposes. They're not gonna judge you like how magicians, your peers, would judge you. You know. So, so as you progress uh, through to the next round, do you have this confidence that I can win this whole thing? I mean. Sure, in front of the camera, you have to sound confident. It's like, yeah, I can win this whole thing. But deep inside, did you know that you had a chance? I, I knew that singers had always done really well uh, on AGT. Usually, the winners would be, you know, a singer with a with a really good, really good sob story. That's what they yes. say. Yes, <laughs> all about the sob <laughs> yeah, story. You have to have a good sob story in order for you to yeah. win. I just told people my life is everything was true. Everything that happened, everything, my journey to to learning magic, to deciding magic, to be my career was was the honest truth. That's all I had, and I was like, yeah, "Take it or leave it," <laughs> kind of thing. Maybe it wasn't so much me. Um, I, I, my wife, uh, Casey, she she had the most utmost confidence that I would win. My producer, Kayla, she she literally was like, "I think you're gonna win," but she said it in a way where she was so confident about it that it gave me confidence. So I think it was the people kind of around me that really helped give me this boost of okay, I think I can actually do this, so just, so just so do your best. What strikes me as kind of interesting um, is the fact that you just seem so normal. You, you just seem like the, the yeah. same, you know, humble guy that experienced an epic failure back in, you know, 2012. But how do you just stay grounded? 
It's pretty tough. Yeah, I won't lie. There, there are times where, where I'm like, no, what, what are you talking about? I'm the, I'm the same uh, to yeah. like, you know, my wife and even my mom and my dad and stuff. <laughs> but um, for all of this, I was, I was like, oh man, look at all these celebrities. Like, how could you ever end up like that? If all this money, like, it's supposed, to, you're supposed to, it's supposed to be easier for you, you know, to, to stay the same and not, not get all messed up. But no, it actually makes it way more, way more difficult. Give me an example of the type of temptation you face on a daily basis because of your celebrity status. You. <laughs> You can do anything you want, really. <laughs> like you can get anything you want, especially with your status, and then and then being able to say things in a certain way. Like you know when you're you know you know when you're performing and the type of influence you have on the audience. Yeah. You you can use the same type of influence in real life. <laughs> you know, so is 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 that type, same type of energy, and 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 you shouldn't, but you know, but but you can. So there's there's this. It's very tempting. People that are closest to you that will tell you you're not doing the right thing right now. And there's many times that that happens to me and I have to catch myself. I'm like, oh, you're right. It's tough. And then there's also like substances and stuff. You know, there's, there's that temptation oh. as well. And, and it's so easily accessible here in, in America, you know? So it's just like, you have to keep yourself away from all of that. And Interesting. it's so easy, you know, it's yeah. easy as, as a, you know, especially <laughs> not only just being in the US, but also being like kind of having so many connections in the US. Right, right, right. You can literally get anything you want or do anything you want. So it's it's this yeah, you just got to you got to always remember where you came from, especially with like drugs and stuff like that. I luckily like my friends that haven't haven't really gone we had like uh, that haven't got maybe gone down that path or anything like that. So I luckily I've been fine with that. But like in terms of like monetary stuff like yeah I've, I've actually been screwed over quite a lot so, oh, really? so yeah 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 so I've, I've learned a lot from that <laughs> yeah so it's it's been um uh, a good learning experience <laughs> i hopefully it doesn't happen again it tends to happen you kind of realize who your real friends are you know and who, who your not real friends are what is it like to live that that celebrity lifestyle you know does that sort of give you still that mental sharpness and clarity to wanting to improve on your craft or do you feel like, you know what, I, I've, I've made it, I, I've arrived and now I just gotta keep this up. Like what, what keeps yeah. you going? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'll ever say, and, and like Casey will agree with me. I, I will never be like, oh yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy with where I am. I, I don't think, uh, I, for some reason, I guess my brain just doesn't think that way or I, I won't accept it. <laughs> I don't know why. It's probably my ADHD. I'm pretty sure I have ADHD. I, I'm always like wanting to do many things, many things at once. And so, if it's not magic, I'm learning how to, like, I'm learning how to juggle right now with, with balls. So, like, I'm, I'm trying to, like, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm always, like, trying to learn, like, a new thing, whether it's knowledge-based or skill-based. Being, like, a well-known person, uh, and I'm not even, like, that big of a celebrity. I'm just, like, kind of, like, a locally known, like, in Vegas. Like, you know, everyone in Vegas knows me, but, like, it's very lonely. I have, I have a lot of friends who are famous as well, but I think we all have a pretty equally lonely life because we have to stay mostly indoors and then everything that happens outside of our house is pretty artificial it's not really that real and or at least not authentic because it's it's almost impossible for people that you don't really know you know once you're at a certain level of fame or, or whatever it is like it's not truly like authentic and so uh when it comes to like a personal level i'm sure there's things that are like monetary that that is real or, or whatever, but like in terms of like, you know, who you are and, and whether they actually know you. So it is kind of lonely. So, so I think, I guess it, I, I spent a lot of time in the house. I, I spent a lot of time just practicing and, and gaining new, new knowledge of other stuff. Uh, hello. Oh, oh, oh there's, there's, there's another dog, there's yeah. Natsu, another <laughs> Pomeranian. Yeah, very smart dog, very smart guy. That's very cute. When you say, hey, I'm still working on stuff to get to the next level. I want to be the ultimate entertainer. But where do you go from here? Like you've literally achieved everything under the sun in your profession. So uh, are we talking like, I don't know, TV special or like, where, where do you want to go? Film is probably the, the next direction where I'm kind of delving into a little bit. I mean, I've, I've always had that interest anyways, even before everything. I mean, when I was like 10 years old, it was, it was music and movies. That was what I was doing. In, in terms of like everyday stuff, everyday improvements, I'm always working on the show. I'm, I'm making the show better. I'm working on a, a, a new magic act. I'm also, I'm experimenting with, uh, with the little uh, film, the, um, yeah, I can't talk too much about it. So. Sure, sure, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But do you get a lot of uh, emails and messages from you know young aspiring like magicians who really look up to you? Uh, at my meeting greets, I have so many young magicians, and I, I absolutely love this. They always ask questions and they ask me for tips and tricks, and I and I we would teach them right right in front of. And we have it's funny because we have an audience for the meet and greet, you know, because the meet and greet there's about like thirty people, twenty people, so there's a small little audience where we would. Almost like session in front of them. What you just described defies like a, the conventional thinking that oh well, I have to guard my secret, you know, because you you said you love teaching, but isn't there some sort of like a conflict? Because ultimately you do want to deliver that 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 magic to mm -hmm. people. Of course, you just don't teach everything. <laughs> you know, you, you just teach some stuff. I, I, for me, I teach all the basics that are needed to accomplish the effect. That's what the kids deserve because that's what I would have wanted when I was. I remember when I was 16 and I was trying to learn a specific trick and I just couldn't find it, and it was just so frustrating. And it took me like five years to to be able to finally learn it. And I'm like, oh, so that's how you do it. Okay, now I can proceed to learning how to like master it. And so I really feel like the basics should be given. To, to the kids so that they can learn if they want if they want to be a magician i i understand the whole secret thing you know then secrets being revealed yes but there's there's more to magic than just secrets there's there's more than just the the method it's a, the method is g g generally a big part of it there's so much more to it you know there, there's things that that you can't really teach and that you have to find out for yourself and then the moment you find that special thing that's when it changes the performance completely and it becomes more than just this is a card trick now it becomes oh wow this is like this is art that's what i want the kids to achieve so then what do you tell uh, those young kids who are to them you're the the ultimate role model right you know you seem very friendly approachable and and you know you love like mentoring these kids and if they want to be a magician in the future, like what would you tell them? Oh, go on YouTube. <laughs> you can learn everything. <laughs> you can learn everything on YouTube so far. But yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, just try to learn all the basics. There, there's books. There's uh, you, there's online um, online stores where you can buy you can buy magic. There's actual physical magic stores you can uh, learn and buy magic. But try to learn all the basics as fast as you can. You know, when you're young, that's important. Now, like I'm 31, so I probably wouldn't really be able to pick it up as quickly. So, so, so when you're a kid, you know, 10, 11, 12, try to learn all those moves as much as possible. When you're uh, when you're older, then you can kind of you can because you have all these basics all learned and, and all mastered, then you can work on the other stuff, the more important stuff than just technicals. You know, you can learn on misdirection. You can learn on the way you portray yourself, the way the atmosphere that you're giving to the audience. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I made this mistake a lot when I was learning. I, I would just try to just copy some other magician's style. Blaine, for example, I grew up watching Blaine. He was one of the first magicians. I was like, oh, I want to do that type of magic. It was because of David Blaine. I was like, I want to do this. like, because you know, I, I saw there's so many types of magic out there, and Blaine was the one that was made me choose close up. I was like, a oh, close up is a cool. Do you cool guys magic. actually so, know each other now? Mm -hmm. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know each other. Yeah, I have his number. <laughs> It's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, I can't believe I have David Blaine's number. I'm texting him right now. What's it like in real person? I'm sure you guys use Matt as well, right? Yeah, he's actually the same uh, as he is on TV. So he's like, <laughs> he's, it was so, it was the first time I ever met him in real life, I was with my, my really good friend, Teddy, and we're, we were doing the meet and greet with David Copperfield. And wow. I was like, oh my gosh, it was so, it was so amazing. We just met David Copper. We just saw a show. This was so amazing. How crazy would it be if we met David Blaine? And I kid you not, he, David Blaine walks, because I don't know if, uh, well, you have him in Vegas, but in, in Vegas, uh, in Copperfield's meet and greet area, right. it's really dark. So you can't really, you can't really see anything, especially once you go through the exit door, it's super dark. So yeah. we're walking towards the exit door. And then Blaine just appears from darkness <laughs> and he's like, yo, nice to meet you. And I'm like, oh my God, it's David Blaine. <laughs> it was like, it was the craziest, uh, craziest experience. When I was uh, seeing performers that I really loved and, and admired, I'm not talking about Blaine at this point now. Now I'm talking yeah, about yeah. Um, like other magicians that I found on YouTube. So yeah. I tried to be like them, you know, I tried to like kind of almost like copy essentially their style. Mm. I was lucky that I caught myself doing that, and I was like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. I should, I, I should be a little bit more different. I should be more myself. People always say, like, oh, you, you, Shin, you create the most original magic. Oh, I have to say, no, 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 and it's not true. I, I, I don't. I always get my magic from 
the classics always people that created it before me i don't actually invent anything all, all i did was i just put my personality into it and now all of a sudden it's it seems new you know that's my kind of my advice to all the the younger kids um you want the quickest way to be unique just be yourself and and that and true and it's true because then no one is like you because no human is the same it's gonna be hard to figure out how to to make it seem really seamless and natural because sometimes it, it doesn't and, and it just takes a little bit of tweaking to figure out but once you do it's it's really special and then you be and all of a sudden people are like oh wow there's something special about this this guy for some reason for some reason this this actor is just different somehow and and so you know that's um that's what you got to figure out this is something i've been meaning to sort of ask you because you know if we take it all the way to the beginning yes you're an immigrant you know you're now living the american dream but a lot of people might have the limiting beliefs about you know you for example being asian and whether you can succeed in American society. To me, it sounds like you got to where you are not because of your race or you know because of a certain background, but because you just work freaking hard. It's about your talent and your skills and your hard work. Yeah, what you said is 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 true. Like I remember when I was first starting out in Magic, one of the main things like a lot of my friends told me, there's no Asian entertainers. Like there's no like Asian celebrities. So how are you gonna make it? You know, and it was, they were, they were, they weren't lying. It was true. I didn't, I never saw really like, I mean, of course, you know, there's like Jackie Chan and Jet Li too, but like there wasn't, yeah. this is what, when I'm like 16, 17, there wasn't like this great representation of like actors, for example, like Asian actors. And, and so like, it was really tough. I didn't really think about that too much per se. I, I, like you said, I, I always just kept saying, okay, I just keep working at your craft. Yes, this, th it definitely isn't fair that there wasn't this representation in Hollywood and there wasn't a, re it mainly, actually it's mainly in Hollywood. You know, for me in the back of my mind, I, I always said, I hope it changes. Um, and I still do, I still hope it changes. I hope, I hope there is more representation and I am seeing a lot more now, which is, which is amazing. But you, know, you weren't like, necessarily uh, thinking about, oh, you know, I can't do this because I'm Asian, because I'm an immigrant. No, 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 yeah. no, no, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wouldn't accept that <laughs> because that would be, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah it wouldn't be a good enough excuse for me not to do something. Like the only excuse that would say, oh, you can't do magic anymore is if my hands got chopped off. <laughs> then I would say, then I would say yeah. yeah, okay, I think you're right. I probably, I probably yeah. can't do it anymore. But um, other than that, like, uh, yeah, no excuse, no excuses for me because then I'm just kind of being, uh, I'm, complaining you know you know what i mean like just uh, yeah, yeah 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 i guess lastly what does magic mean to you well magic is uh for me is um is not not only like my way of kind of showing people who i am you know like in my perform through my performance and what i kind of the message that i'm trying to, to give out to people so there's there's that part but to be honest magic is also like my passion it's just something that i love to do is the thing that i fall back on always every time all those down times that we had mentioned magic was always there for me to keep my mind occupied you know something for me to do and so for me magic is this thing that's keep me like so happy and it's really changed my life it saved my life and i hope that i can bring that to people who want to learn yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, people who want to learn and who also want to appreciate the art, the art. That's true. Yes, right? yes, that's true. That is true. The people who also love to watch it as well and, and yeah. be entertained. Yeah. Because we are sort of in that news journalism type of field where, where we feel like because we're so always we're bombarded with negativity on a daily basis that people could use some hope. They could use some wholesome entertainment. They could be inspired. And, and to me, magic is one of those things where it makes you feel like you're a kid again. And you, yes. you all of a sudden feel a little uh, hopeful about the world or something like that. So how do you feel about yeah. that? For that moment that you're watching the performance, you truly believe that that man on stage is performing a, a, mir a true miracle. You believe in magic. I, I believe in it too. You know, sometimes when I watch a magician, yeah. I get transported to that world and I'm in disbelief just for that slight moment. But it's amazing because, I mean, how often does that happen? You know, how often do you truly forget about everything in the world except for this one moment? 
and yeah, that's that's magic. Truly, that actually is magic, you know. <laughs> yeah, to me. Everybody should go check out your shows, and then you know, love to check it out myself uh, if I'm ever in Vegas. Uh, but uh, yeah, Shin, you know, thank you so much for your time. No, uh, thank you. Thank you for having and, me. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, we can catch up in person, uh, in not this distant future. I, I really hope that would could happen. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me do this. Uh, this is great. Thank you.